Thanks. Beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The beginning was the word, and the word was with God. He had the mind, the precious mind of Christ. We can be sure. I'm as stiff from the other night. Oh. That's what happens when you get old. All right. Good evening, everyone. Should have took a break. I know I should have, but I was having too much fun. Once you have the crowd up and roaring, you got to keep going. You can't let them. You can't let them walk. You can't let them calm down. Got to keep it going. I was having too much fun. So, anyways. Then you have to take a break, and then 10, 15 minutes later, you know, like, oh, I've got to crank it up again. So, sorry. But when I was younger, I could take a break, and no problem cranking it back up again. But anyways, uh, good evening to all of you. <laughs> uh, just a reminder, we don't have uh, class Thursday. Some people are playing hooky. No, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, this, this Thursday, uh, we will not have class. Once in a while, we do that. So, uh, I won't say anything else about it. <laughs> but anyways, I'm just kidding. I don't care. It gives me a night off. All right, uh, so this Thursday, don't come here. We won't be here. And uh, uh, what else? Um, keep in prayer, Tyler Thompson. He has a big interview tomorrow at Rockwell. This is to determine his fate, if he's going to get that internship at Rockwell Collins, where his dad works. So let's hope so. They're probably going to do a background check. Oh, they know his dad. So I was going to say, make sure he's not a Russian spy or a Chinese spy. It looks kind of funny. But anyway, so yeah, keep him in prayer. And then also keep McDonald's in prayer because Cheyenne's now working there. <laughs> you get that? So uh, 
It's really good. So she's working, and she's going to be working there on Sundays. This Sunday, you're starting your first day, huh? You nervous? No? Yeah, right. I would be. My first day, I think I was, too. But then again, I worked for my dad my first day. <laughs> I, so anyways, back in my day, like your, like your dad, he worked when he came out of the womb. You know, his mother had him, plop. He was out, and he was out working with his dad. Same with me. My dad had me working in the bowling alleys, working in his printing ink place. I, I was like a toddler, you know. You see me coming home and, you know, my fat crawling home, you know. <laughs> Forget it. I'll embellish the story forever. So anyways, uh, yeah, so back in the old days. So congratulations, Cheyenne, and, I, and my, my best. I keep you in prayer, my buddy over there. And what else I need to? Oh, we remember we have June 11th to the 12th. We have Mike and Carolyn Fletcher. And uh, so the, the state of Iowa will be in a state of emergency during that period of time. So look out. Here come the Fletchers, June 11th through the 12th, Mike and Carolyn Fletcher. So if, if those of you are Internet people want to come in town during that time, that would be great. It would be great more, more the merrier, but uh, we'll see what happens on that. But, yeah, they're coming in the 11th to the 12th. We're really looking forward to it. Uh, I don't think I've ever I've, – I've never met Carolyn face-to-face and I met Mike when I face to face when I left GBC, which was coming up on 15 years ago in 2001, and uh, August of 2001. So it's going to be re- great to uh, uh, hook up with them, and then they get to meet the Thompsons and everybody out here. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. And I think that's about it for the announcements. So let's uh, remember we're continuing our study of Second Timothy. We're already in chapter two, and we're going to be noting Second Timothy two nine. And then this verse, Paul encourages Timothy by telling him the word of God is never imprisoned, even though he, Paul, was in prison at the time when he wrote this epistle. He was imprisoned as a criminal. Of course, he wasn't a criminal. He was in prison because he was a communicator of the gospel. So uh, that is our subject here this evening. So without further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer. We do this to examine ourselves, to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father. Uh, When we do that, we're restored to fellowship with God, and that fellowship with God is maintained by bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God. And uh, that when we do that, we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another beautiful day here in Iowa. We thank you for the, the warmer weather here in this spring. It's finally arrived, and we just thank you, Father, for the change of seasons. Uh, we thank you, Father, for uh, all your logistical grace blessings that you've given to us, food, shelter, clothing, the homes that we live in, the jobs that we have, the salaries that we have. Uh, we thank you for this country that we live in, the freedoms that we have to preach the gospel without persecution, something that was not experienced by Paul and Timothy in the first century and the apostles and our Lord. We just thank you, Father, for uh, our spiritual blessings that we have because of our union and identification with your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, uh, for the fact that through the baptism of the Spirit we were identified with your Son in his death and resurrection. So help us to appropriate by faith our union and identification with the Son, with your Son, Jesus Christ, by considering ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God so that we might experience victory over sin and Satan now and in time uh, before the rapture, the resurrection of the church, which we thank you, we thank you for as well. Uh, we know that uh, we're going to get a resurrection body, and this is imminent, and, uh, and we know that uh, we can get rewards if we're faithful. Help us to put things in proper perspective and to obtain your perspective in life from the Bible and the Spirit's teaching in, the, in your word so that we might uh, order our priorities properly and put you first, obedience to you first, and uh, not human relationships or uh, jobs or businesses or entertainment or animals or whatever we think, whatever Satan can use in life to get us away from pure uh, devotion to you and your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father... 
We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the things that we've been learning in 2 Timothy and also in Colossians on Sundays. Help us in this study this evening to, uh, through the power of the Spirit, understand what is being taught. Help us to apply what we're learning to our daily lives and our walk with you. We pray that this study would draw us closer to you and your son and in, in more intimate fellowship, and also we pray that it would produce more of the character of Christ in our lives. We also pray that you'd give grace to myself Empower me to communicate your word with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect and power, so that your people are built up and edified spiritually, and you and your son glorified. We also pray that you would help Tyler and Titus with the sound and recordings. We thank you for their service and the technology that you've given to us and the people, not only here in the Thompson home, but also those who are listening right now live through the website or at a later date through the recordings. We thank you for each and every one of them. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You should be at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. We'll start right there. I don't know if I told you to go there at first, but uh, you should be there now. 2 Timothy 2, 8, and I'm reading from the New American Standard at this point. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. For which gospel I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. So remember the context in which Paul is writing this. He's in his second Roman imprisonment. He's in the Mamertime dungeon, a totally different set of circumstances than his first Roman imprisonment where he had his own rented quarters according to Acts 28. So he is uh, in a very bad place. Uh, this is just prior to his execution, which is uh, imminent. Uh, he is going to eventually be beheaded by uh, Nero. Uh, more than likely, Nero is fingering him and the apostles for the fire in Rome, which he set uh, with, a, with, his, uh, with a band of uh, evildoers. He uh, actually instigated the fire of Rome so he could rebuild it in his image. And, of course, they blamed it on the Christians. That was the first great uh, persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire. Uh, in the 60s of the first century, in the mid-60s of the first century, and uh, this is around the period of time where Paul gets arrested. So more than likely, he, like Peter, was arrested and he was fingered or framed for being the ones who set the, uh, ordered the setting of this fire to Rome. So, of course, they didn't do it. In fact, secular historians like Ta uh, Tacitus and Suetonius, they mentioned that the Roman people were actually, the Roman citizens were very... Uh, uh, felt bad for the Christians for, because they knew that Nero is the one who set this. He was a megalomaniac. He was a crazy person at that point in his reign. And, uh, of course, uh, not too long after he executed Paul, he, he Nero, was uh, committed suicide. And uh, so it thus ended his, uh, his tyrannical reign. So Paul is trying to encourage Timothy here, Timothy's circumstances at this time. We saw a little bit of that in chapter 1. Timothy, and the first Timothy, I should say, and also parts of uh, first, uh, second Timothy chapter one. Uh, Timothy is uh, in, uh, stationed in Ephesus, and he is uh, Paul's delegate to the Ephesian church there in the churches of Asia. Uh, and uh, so what we saw that the majority in 2 Timothy 1.15, the majority of Christians in Asia, the Roman province of Asia, had abandoned Paul. Onesiphorus was one of those few that did not. So they abandoned Paul because he was arrested by the Roman authorities and to identify with Paul was a dangerous thing to do because the Roman authorities could arrest you and imprison you and kill you just like they did Paul. So you had to have walk in faith in the Lord if you were going to have the courage to be a friend of Paul at that time. So Paul's writing this epistle to Timothy, one, to encourage him not to be ashamed of the gospel and his imprisonment, but also to tell him that you know, he wants to, uh, Timothy uh, to be encouraged and not to be ashamed of the gospel and his imprisonment, but also uh, he wants Timothy to come and visit him. So, uh, so for that to take place, for Timothy to actually see Paul, uh, it would mean that Timothy would have to walk in faith and the word of God and, and not in fear of what uh, Rome might do to him. And so he's facing persecution. So therefore, with this persecution of the apostles and Christian leaders, that, that means Timothy would be facing persecution as well from the Roman authorities. So he's dealing with apostasy in the church, with the false teachers, and now the persecution of Rome. So he's getting hit from every side. And he's a young man, and now his friend, his, uh, his, uh, the uh, man who he was his mentor, who was his teacher in the Word of God for decades, is uh, now going to be departing this earth. So there's a lot on the loss of the, the imminent loss of Paul was going to be weighing on Timothy at this time. So Timothy needed as much encouragement as he could get. 
And of course, we do know that Paul acknowledged that Timothy was operating in faith in Paul's apostolic teaching. Paul was convinced of this, as we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1. So everything that Paul's saying here in 2 Timothy, this epistle, would indicate that Paul simply encouraging Timothy to continue doing what he was already doing, continuing his obedience to his apostolic teaching. So we're going to see here in verse 9 now, Paul encourages Timothy by telling him the word of God is never in prison, even though he, Paul, was in prison as a criminal by the Roman authorities. So in 2 Timothy 2.8, again, it says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, a descendant according to my gospel, for which gospel I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. And when he says, for which, at the very beginning of verse 9, that's marking the gospel as the reason why Paul suffered hardship even to the point of being a criminal. Or in other words, Paul is saying that I'm in prison because of proclaiming the gospel, which is about Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. So that's telling us He's not, he was never arrested because he was a criminal, because he committed some crime, or he was an enemy of the Roman Empire. Uh, he was not, it was no, uh, far from the truth. He was uh, simply communicating the gospel. He was a, an apostle, as he mentioned before, a teacher and a preacher of the gospel. And that was why he was arrested. Now, when he says, I suffer hardship, that's the word kakopatheo. It means to endure hardship, to endure suffering. And it refers, of course, to Paul. Uh, enduring undeserved suffering because of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. There will be times as a communicator of the gospel, whether you're a, a teacher, of the, a pastor teacher, or an evangelist, where you'll be persecuted for, for the sake of the gospel because you communicate it. Remember, we're in enemy territory. Satan's kingdom wishes to destroy the gospel and to tr destroy its communicators, and he's tried to do that throughout the centuries. And of course, uh, will be times where we're going to have to suffer in undeserved suffering. We have to go through it. And of course, this will happen sometimes to people where, who are just, uh, you know, Christians who are not pastors or evangelists, who because they communicate, they're operating in their royal ambassadorship, are communicating the gospel to the unsaved and communicating the word of God to their fellow Christians to encourage them and instruct them are going to be persecuted at times for doing this as well. There might come times where you have to suffer undeservedly. Now, part of the reason, as we've seen in the past, for undeserved suffering is to draw us closer to God so that we can man uh, we could uh, uh, experience the power of God's uh, power of God's word in our lives, and despite our human weakness, our impotence, uh, we see that the power of God is manifested in our human weakness. And so uh, this is what we have Paul uh, Paul's, uh, saying, I have suffered undeservedly. Of course, this is all a part of God's plan. It's to develop the character of Christ in my life, uh, also for my benefit, so I can experience the power of God in my human weakness and the power of the gospel, and the power of Christ's resurrection. And uh, remember in Philippians 3, 10 and 11, Paul says, you know, he talks about being conformed uh, to uh, Christ's sufferings and the fellowship of his sufferings so that he might attain to the exit resurrection, uh, meaning if I, by suffering undeservedly, I'm experiencing identification with Christ in his crucifixion, his death, and by doing so, I will now be able to experience uh, Christ's resurrection in my life, which is true of me positionally, well, I'll be able to experience it, uh, this resur Christ's resurrection in my life by going through undeserved suffering. So uh, we might not like it, but it's a part of our walk with God. So if we're going to grow up spiritually, you are going to face undeserved suffering. It's nothing to fear. Uh, it's actually one of the ways that God is obviously training and developing the character of his children. And so we're his children, so he is going to develop the character of our, our he's going to develop our character. And we have to be, uh, we have to be, uh, also when we get tested, uh, we should rejoice because God is rejo reforming the character of Christ and in, in his of his son in our lives to our undeserved suffering. So we should rejoice because ultimately, actually, it's going to bear results uh, at the Bema seat. We're going to go through, by going through undeserved suffering, uh, we're going to get rewards. And if we pass the test and we're faithful to the uh, undeserved suffering, we will get rewards at the Bema seat. This is uh, clearly mentioned by James in James 1, 
it was it 1 2 and also uh, 1 12 so we need to keep this in mind and this is what Paul knew and this is what gave Paul confidence so he knew that uh, even though he was suffering undeservedly here for the cause of the gospel it's a part of God's plan this is no surprise he was anticipating this and he embraced it Philippians 1 29 as we've seen in the past Paul uh, says it's a it's a privilege to suffer for the gospel to suffer for Christ so if we ever have to go through it undeservedly suffering for the gospel it's for Jesus Christ and it's one of the greatest honor it's the greatest honor you could ever expect to experience in life now he says even to imprisonment he says I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal when he says even to imprisonment that's marking the degree to which Paul was suffering hardship because of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that would indicate that Paul suffered hardship because of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the point of or we could say to the extent of suffering imprisonment as a criminal as a criminal expresses the manner in which Paul suffered hardship to the point of imprisonment so he's saying I'm, I'm treated as a criminal I haven't done anything wrong if I'm teaching the gospel which is truth then why am I imprisoned so he's being imprisoned and of course Nero and the Roman authorities uh, like all human governments are under the deception of Satan that's why we're to pray for our leaders first Timothy chapter 2 1 through 7 and so Satan is instigating Nero for this persecution of Christians like Paul and, and, and Peter and he's treating them as criminals and of course they're not criminals uh, in fact most of the world today a lot of parts of the world today not most of the world but quite a bit of uh, the earth and, and the various governments of the earth treat Christians who Bible believing Christians who teach the Bible as criminals uh, they'll arrest them and persecute them and execute them and treat them as criminals that's taken place since the beginning of the church and uh, so uh, we're in our country we're in America and uh, we're not used to this we don't we don't see this in our country right now though Christianity more and more and those who are teaching the Word of God are more and more being looked upon with scorn and led by the the media today which is of course insta uh, driven by the devil and his cosmic system so uh, we never uh, our country was founded uh, for the uh, based upon uh, the freedom of religion where we could have the freedom to worship God and uh, or, or not to worship God or worship Jesus Christ without persecution. This was not true in the the, uh, the, uh, the the nations of Europe. Our ancestors, the ones who first started this country over in Europe, they fled the ch the, the state-run religions in those countries because if you weren't, let's say you were you you were a Protestant and you did not agree with the Pope, if that that country you lived in was Catholic and the Pope was the boss for that, you know, the, you were you were persecuted and uh, Protestants were persecuted by the Catholic Church and vice versa we've seen in the past that the Protestants would persecute Catholics so but the main point is uh, they, all these people came to flee the persecution and in the Europe and the European states came to America and freedom of religion was a big thing so our country from its inception is protected people like us who want to worship Jesus Christ and are Bible believing Christians and gave in fact most of our college pretty much all of our colleges I say in this country and at the beginning of the inception of this country like Harvard University were theological seminaries they were they were they were uh, obviously sympathetic to Christianity and the Bible well that's not the case anymore and we become more and more secularized and so we've drifted away from our, our Judeo-Christian uh, roots and now we get a situation which we've never seen in this country before with postmodernism and the antagonism to Christians in the Bible and the uh, ridiculing of Christians in the Bible like never before in this country. Whereas a hundred years ago, you didn't see it to the extent you have it today. And of course, what's proliferated that is the media. And the media is liberal in its leanings, most of it. And when I say liberal, I'm not just talking about that they're Democrats or something like that. I'm talking they're liberal in their and their their way of uh, way of life. They're amoral, many of them, and they could care less about absolute truth. And they want to they want to pro uh, they want to promote you know sex and 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 what whatever else that's out there that make uh, that uh, that corresponds to Satan's cosmic system, living for self and uh, all about you and forget about other people. And so we have 
uh, in our country now, we're seeing this drifting away from the Bible like never before. So we're not, we've never, we never experienced something like this in this country where people get arrested, a pastor gets arrested for teaching the gospel in his, you know, in his house church or his built church building, wherever he is, or talking to somebody about the gospel. He's not getting arrested for that today. But that could change in the ne next 25 years, maybe 10 years, maybe less than that. You never know. But uh, so we can't really identify with that. So uh, Paul, though, uh, he, he, he went through this on a number of occasions uh, where he was arrested simply because he was communicating the truth. And if he's communicating the truth, that means he's not a criminal. But here he's saying, I'm treated as a criminal, even though I've done nothing to, be con uh, done nothing to justify that treatment. Now, then he says in the adversative clause, but the word of God is not in prison. And this is the thrust of Paul, what P Paul's saying, not to emphasize um, his imprisonment, that, uh, that he's suffering for the cause of the gospel, but he's trying to emphasize here for Timothy, for Timothy's enc encouragement, that the word of God, despite whatever happens to the communicators of the word of God, like myself, Paul's saying, the word of God will continue to go forward. And uh, nothing can stop that. And that's really what should be the attitude of every Christian, especially every pastor and evangelist, we can, we're going to be replaced. We're just servants of Christ. One guy's going to, I'll, you know, one day I'll be gone from the scene, and then somebody else will be in my place somewhere, you know. So it, it's, it, the main thing, though, is the Word of God continues forward. That's what really matters. So the phrase, but the Word of God is not in prison, that stands in direct contrast with the previous statement that Paul was suffering imprisonment because of Jesus Christ to the point of imprisonment as a criminal. Thus, the contrast is between Paul being imprisoned as a criminal and the impossibility of the word of God ever being imprisoned. Now, the word of God, it refers to the gospel, because if you notice, if you carefully, that Paul has previously stated that he suffered hardship because of the gospel. Now he says in the adversative clause, but the word of God is never in prison. So the gospel is a word from God. A word In the Greek, it means a word originating from God. So we have revelation from originating from God. That's the gospel. And as we saw with the gospel, the gospel people today, they cookie cut the word and they look at it in relation solely toward the non-Christian. And as we've seen in the past and in the, in the scriptures, the gospel is used in relation to the Christian in the sense that the Christian's identification with Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father is good news for us because if we appropriate that position by faith and consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God, we will experience the victory over sin and Satan his cosmic system that is uh, the result of Christ's victory through his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. So that's good news for us. So the unsaved, of course, the good news is if they trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection has reconciled them to a holy God, propitiated the Father, and is also uh, 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 not only that, but has redeemed us, uh, the human race out of the slave market of sin. And if the sinner appropriates this, this his Christ's death and resurrection and the benefits of it, reconciliation, redemption, propitiation, uh, he will receive eternal salvation through exercising faith in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. He's delivered from eternal condemnation and physical death and spiritual death, all that and, 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 and condemnation from the law through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. So the, uh, we see here the good news is a word from God, and Paul makes that clear here in the adversative clause. And then it says... The word of God is not in prison. Uh, there's a little bit of Greek, uh, very little, but just a tiny bit I need to mention because the New American Standard doesn't in, in, in translate it as emphatically as it should. And the reason why I say that is that uh, is not in prison is composed, first of all, of the verb deo. And this word is negated emphatically by the emphatic negative adverb u. Sometimes it's uk, you see it. Now, the reason why it's emphatic, it, this is emphatic, so you should translate it with a word in English that's emphatic, never. Not would be a good word to translate the other negative Greek particle, may. But it's, it's not being used here. And because this is, Paul wants to be objective, final, absolute. He's saying with this emphatic negative, and he wants to be emphatic, he's saying that the word of God is never in prison. Or you could even translate it absolutely never in prison. Paul is, is being absolute about this. He's being final about this, clear cut. So that's why I say that we should change the translation a little bit there. Instead of the word not, 
Use something that's more emphatic, more emphatic negative uh, in, in, from English. So the verb de, uh, deo, it means to imprison. It's correctly translated. It pertains to causing someone to be under the authority of, an, of someone or something else. It means to confine someone by various kinds of restraints. So again, this word's meaning is emphatically, negative, uh, emphatically negated by the emphatic negative adverb u, which means never or absolutely never, because it's expressing absolute, direct, and full negation of the word of God being imprisoned. So therefore, these two words indicate that the word of God, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, is never imprisoned, Paul's saying. Now, it's interesting. The perfect tense of this verb, deo, is what we call a gnomic perfect. That's used to speak of a generic or proverbial occurrence. And here... It's expressing the idea that the word of God as an eternal spiritual truth is never in prison. So the idea with the perfect tense is that it's an eternal spiritual truth. It's a spiritual axiom. The perfect tense is telling us, this gnomic perfect. It's a spiritual axiom that the word of God can absolutely never be imprisoned. The communicators can be in prison, but the word of God will never be in prison. Wherever it goes, it has its omnipotence. Wherever it goes... It, it does its thing. And this is something I think you're going to find it should be encouraging for pastors, evangelists, and people, Christians of all ilk, of different types of races and nas nationalities and genders. It's, it's going to be a real, good, a real great encouragement to us to know that the, about the omnipotence of the Word of God and that it's not about our eloquence, or anything like that that's going to affect the conversion of somebody or affect the change in somebody. It's the Spirit of God working through the gospel that's going to bring about conversion of the unsaved and uh, also the, the, the conformity of the Christian's character to the, the image of Christ. It's all God's power. And all we are are the mouthpieces. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it's not on us to be eloquent. It's not, it just get it accurate. Now, the perfect tense is also what we call an intensive perfect, meaning that it emphasizes a present state produced by a past action. Now, the present state here would refer to the freedom in which the gospel is proclaimed in the Roman Empire in Paul's day in the first century A.D. The past action refers to eternity past when the Father designed a plan to provide salvation for sinful humanity through His Son, becoming a human being, and then dying in the place of sinful humanity, and then rising from the dead to create a new humanity. Now look at 2 Timothy 2.8 in my translation. We're going to look at verses 8 and 9, and then we're going to bring out some things about uh, what Paul said here in verse 9. So look at 2 Timothy 2.8 in my translation, please. Second Timothy 2.8. Continue making it your habit, of remembering Jesus, who is the Christ, as risen from the dead ones, David's biological descendant, in accordance with my gospel, because of which gospel I am presently suffering hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal. But in fact, the word of originating from God is never in prison. So, as we noted in verse 8, Paul issued Timothy another command. He ordered his young delegate and disciple and friend to continue to make it his habit of remembering Jesus Christ as risen from the dead ones, who is King David's biological descendant, and who has in will, as we saw last Thursday, fulfill the Davidic covenant. And then Paul says, this is all according to his gospel. Now in verse 9, he continues to write about the gospel. So he, he left off talking about the gospel. Now he's continuing to talk about it and describe it and its attributes. He reminds Timothy here in verse 9 that he was presently suffering hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal because of the very same gospel, this very same gospel was the reason why, whose subject is the, about the person, life, teaching, and death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, who is the Messiah. So Paul in verse 9 is reminding Timothy he was presently suffering hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal because of this very same gospel. And who's the subject of the gospel? As we saw in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and now in 2 Timothy 2, 8, Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. His death and resurrection is the subject 
of the gospel. Now, when Paul, as I said earlier, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, as we noted in our introduction and earlier this evening in other classes, he was suffering his second Roman imprisonment while languishing in the infamous Mamertine dungeon in the city of Rome, which was a subterranean building consisting of two vaulted chambers. And it's located next to the Forum in Rome. And many people didn't know that for the longest time. Therefore, in 2 Timothy 2.9, Paul is asserting here that he was arrested and imprisoned in Rome because of simply proclaiming the gospel. Obviously, this would mean that he was unjustly incarcerated by the Roman authorities since the gospel is based upon truth. So if what he's teaching is the truth, why is he being imprisoned? Because the, other, the people who are arresting him are being deceived by Satan's kingdom. And they're involved in evil. So Jesus Christ died and rose again. And this can be found... This can be and has been confirmed by witnesses, some of which were the apostles themselves, like Paul, who himself saw Jesus of Nazareth after his resurrection. Now, undoubtedly, Paul's imprisonment was the result of his enemies claiming that he was undermining the authority of Caesar and challenging Rome by proclaiming that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah and the Son of God and Lord of all creation. So this in turn resulted in the arrest of Paul by the Roman authorities. So this was the thing that Rome was, would be sensitive to, is that you're proclaiming this Jesus of Nazareth as king, well, is he a rival to Caesar? Now this was mentioned when they, the, the Pharisees and scribes, the Jewish leaders, railroaded Jesus and brought him to Pilate, and then Pilate found no guilt in him and found Jesus innocent and was going to let him off. But then, sure enough, the, the Jewish authority said, oh, you do that, then you're no friend to Caesar. You know, you're no friend to Caesar. So right there, he let Jesus off. And it's all about this, this uh, you know, uh, Christ kingship, the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, and uh, as a rival to Caesar. So the Roman authority, undoubtedly Paul's opponents, Remember that a lot of these uh, Ju the Judaizers would seek to get Paul uh, arrested. And in fact, we're going to talk about that in Philippians 1 a little later this evening during his first Roman imprisonment. The Judaizers were trying to get Paul killed by actually teaching the gospel. <laughs> Amazingly. We'll see that in Philippians chapter 1. So uh, we have here Paul's imprisonment was undoubtedly the result of his enemies claiming that he undermined the authority of Caesar and challenged Rome by proclaiming that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was the Messiah and the Son of God and the Lord of all creation. And that would in turn a result, have resulted in the arrest of Paul by the Roman authorities. Furthermore, as we noted earlier as well, in the mid-60s of the first century, Nero ordered parts of Rome to be set on fire so that he could rebuild these portions of Rome and in his own image, and then he blamed it on the Christians. Now, Paul was arrested in approximately 67, 68 AD. Some put it a little earlier, like 65, 64. Therefore, because he was an apostle and a leader of the Christians, his rest was more than likely connected to this fire in Rome. So Paul was arrested and executed by Nero, as church history tells us, as a result of this persecution of Christians in Rome. Then, we see in 2 Timothy 2.9, in the adversative clause, Paul states that in contrast to himself being imprisoned by the Roman authorities, the word of God is never imprisoned. The word of God here, of course, is speaking of the gospel, as we pointed out, because Paul has just finished saying that he was suffering hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal because of this very same gospel. The Roman authorities could arrest and execute him but they will never stop the gospel from being proclaimed. Now, you see this in the, in the book of Acts, where the persecution started up against the Christians. What happened? The gospel spread. Let's say, for instance, it started in Jerusalem. Did it not? If you read the book of Acts, it starts off in Jerusalem, the gospel. They start putting Peter evangelizes on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 Jews come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jews from all around the Roman Empire, included Rome. Okay, that's, how the, that's how the gospel got, got back there is because there were Jewish Christians in Rome who got saved. They brought the gospel back to Rome. Well before the Christians, got, uh, before the apostles got there like Paul or Peter. So we see that, the, that, they, that this was, uh, once this took place, the gospel sent it in the city and in the, in the surrounding confines of Jerusalem and Israel. But 
once the persecution started up against them with Herod and those guys, it, then people had to leave. And they went up to Antioch, Syria. And that became a great center for, the, for Christians. In fact, people, Christians got their name there in Antioch, that very same city. And it was a great leaping off point for evangelists like, and church planters like Paul and Barnabas, Antioch was. But that never would have happened if it wasn't for the persecution. So you saw it went to, uh, Jesus predicted this. You go from Jerusalem to Samaria and to the, the re rest of the world, the Antioch, Sarah, it would, the gospel would, it would spread all over the place. And how, what was the means by which this took place? Persecution. So the more, the more people were, more Christians were persecuted in Jerusalem, they left these areas that they were being persecuted, and what did they bring with them? The gospel. So they evangelized people all over these areas that they were being entering into. So it backfired on Satan to do this persecution because the gospel was then spread throughout the rest of the Roman Empire, Mediterranean world, because of the persecutions forced Christians out and they brought the gospel and communicated the gospel and lived out the gospel in their daily lives. And that's how the gospel got all around the world. So we see that that just is another point that you, you can't, you can imprison Christians. You can put to death people like Paul and Peter, but the word of God is going to continue forward. It's going to continue forward. It'll never be imprisoned. So the Roman authorities could arrest and execute Paul, but Paul says they will never stop the gospel from being proclaimed. And that's an encouragement that we need to have because, uh, you know, Christians today, but the celebrity, uh, they're so celebrity conscious because of the American cultures into celebrities, we make a big deal about pastors. But as we saw, Paul says, the word pastors are nothing but servants. He said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So pastors can be replaced, and they are replaced. They die, or they, you know, they, they go home to be with the Lord. And we can't put so much, you know, I'm not saying that to respect the pastor or love your pastor, or if you, let, you get a good one. But I'm saying, you don't, you, you need to understand the power is not the man. It's the message. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Romans 1.16, is it not? Yeah. Well, we need to make less of our, of, the, of our pastors and evangelists and making them celebrities. I'm not saying not to honor them or show them with respect. We're supposed to treat them with respect. But let's not put it, let's not make them an idol. All right? I see that a lot in, Christ, in a lot of circles of Christianity today. And you might know some people who uh, are into that sort of personality cult thing and that's why they put up with uh, pastors who are involved in all kinds of gross immorality and bad behavior because they're into the personality thing. And they, don't, they forget about you know, the character of the guy is very important as well. So therefore, by waging war on the gospel of Jesus Christ, Nero's Rome would be waging war against God. And this is a war that they could never win. In fact... In the end, Rome, under Constantine, was conquered by the gospel because Constantine decreed in A.D. 313, Christianity would be the state religion. So within 300 years, within less than 300 years, the gospel had taken over the Roman Empire. Constantine, Roman Emperor, declared Christianity the state religion. Now, of course, there were drawbacks to doing that. It became paganized in other parts of the world, and a lot of that we see in Roman Catholicism today. But nonetheless, the gospel had conquered Rome. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a great, great history book uh, by a name, by, uh, if you can get it, I don't know if you, it's got to be somewhere you can still get it. He had a, uh, it was a, a book, it's actually a, a set of history books by Will Durant. And he is a great historian. And uh, he got, you get the one Caesar in Christ. He does a great job talking about this about how the gospel conquered the Roman Empire. And it's called Caesar and Christ. Great historian. Now, though Paul was in prison, he was still able to, you got to remember, Paul's saying the gospel is never imprisoned. Now, there's many ways, there's many twists to that. What does that mean? Well, I just mentioned a little bit of what that means. But also, you think about this. Though Paul was in prison, he, could still, he was still able to write letters, which is witnessed by the fact that Timothy received this epistle from him which contained, talked about the gospel. And it was passed along to the Ephesian Christian community and all the churches in Asia around the Roman Empire. So the word of God was not being in prison. Though Paul was in prison, he was still able to communicate the gospel uh, whether uh, to Luke or Timothy or his visitors and also through letter. So in that way, 
it wasn't in prison, the word of God. Thus, Paul could write letters to churches if he could write to Timothy. Consequently, he was communicating in these letters, as we're reading, the gospel to the churches. His imprisonment thus did not imprison the communication of the gospel. Furthermore, Timothy continued to communicate the gospel in Ephesus as well. There were also other teachers of the gospel. Uh, you know, a lot of times us Christians, especially if we're in an area where there's not a lot of positive volition of the word of God and a lot of apostasy among Christians, there's a tendency among us Christians to think, oh, we're the only ones that are doing God's will. That's a joke. We just might be in a bit tough area, but there are a lot of Christians in this country and pastors in this country and evangelists around the world and in this country who are still faithful. Remember, you know, we don't want to have the Elijah complex. Uh, I was uh, listening to uh, J. Vernon McGee, who I, you know, became a Christian, uh, uh, listened to it when I first became a Christian, when I really got first really heavily into the Word of God, that guy, his teaching on the radio, actually turned me on to the Bible like, like nobody else. And uh, so... I remember listening to him the other day, one of his recordings about 2 Timothy, this passage, and he was saying, you know, he, you know he, he at one point got into an Elijah complex. Remember, Elijah, under Ahab and Jezebel, was persecuted, and he, remember, he, he was complaining to God, you know, I'm the only one left in Israel's proclaiming the, tr the truth, and then God says, uh, no, I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, meaning I have 7,000 of my people who are still faithful to me who are not paganized or have not gone into apostasy or become heath or heathens. So he's saying that, you know, McGee was like saying, you know, don't get into a, 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 an Elijah complex, he called it, where you think you're the only one that's out there teaching the truth. There are a lot of people. In fact, if you go on the internet, you can see a lot of ministries are teaching the truth. There's tons of people that are still out there teaching the gospel, which is very encouraging. So in Paul's day, there were other teachers of the gospel, and evangelists throughout the various provinces of the Roman Empire who were continuing to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ despite his being in prison in Rome. So the work was continuing on. And many of those guys that like Tychicus and Epaphroditus that Paul trained and Timothy and Titus, they're out and others that we probably don't know about and they trained guys, Titus and Timothy did, who were out there and faithful to the gospel as evangelists and pastors and just regular lay people, the gospel, though Paul was in prison, they could, Nero could imprison Paul but, and Peter, execute them, which he did, but the work carried on. It carried on. Thus Paul's encouraging, by what he's saying here in verse 9, 2 Timothy 2, 9, Paul's encouraging Timothy here and with the fact that his imprisonment is not hindering the communication of the gospel. Now, there was a passage in Paul uh, that talks in Philippians chapter 1 where Paul talks about his first Roman imprisonment and that how the word of God was proliferating throughout Rome and the Praetorian Guard and Caesar's household despite his being under house arrest, which is another manifestation in history of the fact that the word of God is never in prison even if you communicate even if you imprison the communicators. So let me show you this. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Philippians 1, 12. Philippians 1, 12. Now I want you to know, Philippians, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Where is he? Is under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier, his first Roman imprisonment between 60 and 62 AD. Remember, he wrote Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon from during this Roman imprisonment. He could receive people. He taught people, but he was chained to a Roman soldier. We know that from Ephesians 6.19. We know he had his own rented quarters. Acts 28, the very end of the chapter, says that. So this is what he's his circumstances. And he's saying... <laughs> My imprisonment has actually advanced the gospel. So I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment and the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian God and everyone else. Now don't miss this. Dan Dejek, and this is what he's going to talk about during his first Roman imprisonment. Paul's second Roman imprisonment. Where, who's he have to go before? No doubt probably before Caesar and the Roman authorities. 
And what do you think he's going to do? He communicated the gospel to them. In fact, we're coming up to a passage, I think it's this week, where Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of the gospel. I think it's tomorrow night. I think we do. All sake, things for the, sake, for, the, for the sake of the elect. And he's talking about Christian, people who are going to become Christians in the future through his imprisonment and his proclaiming the gospel. So he's saying, I'm enduring this imprisonment in Rome, the second Roman imprisonment, so that I can get, save some of these people. God can use me as his instrument to communicate the gospel to these people so that they can get saved. And now in his first Roman imprisonment in Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, he's saying that my first Roman imprisonment, it advanced the gospel. So again, he says in verse 12, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the entire Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Everyone else means the Roman city of Rome, the citizens of Rome. The Praetorian Guard, as I've mentioned in the past, is an elite, it's the, it's the flower of the Roman military, they called them, Josephus called them. That means that they were the best of the best, kind of like our Navy SEALs and guys like that. They were, they were the best soldiers that you could have. He evangelized them. Okay? Now, that wouldn't have happened if Paul didn't get imprisoned. When he got imprisoned, he's got guys, a guy, Roman soldiers uh, 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 handcuffed to him, <laughs> chained to him. He's like, thank you, I got a captive audience. You know, a pastor's dream. You, got, you can't leave me. You know, you're stuck with me. You know, that's why Paul, the, you, know, and his, you know, he's like, you know, ooh, maybe pastors should be, hey, arrest me so I can, and chain me to another guy so I can, he can't get, I can't get, he can't get loose, you know. I can, I'm going to give him the gospel, you know, and talk to him about Jesus all night. Imagine that poor, Ro imagine that poor Roman soldier, that Roman soldier listening to him talk about Jesus all the time in the Bible. Pretty funny. So that wouldn't have happened if Paul didn't get imprisoned. Then it says, and that most of the brethren, and this is another thing, not only people getting evangelized that wouldn't have gotten evangelized if I didn't get in prison, but it's giving other Christians the courage to speak boldly the gospel because they see me doing it in the heart of the center of the Roman government, the most powerful nation on the earth and one of the most powerful empires in all of history, which we studied in Daniel. And they see me doing what I'm doing and it's giving them the courage to speak up now. So it backfired on Satan with his persecution of Paul. And so he says, And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some from goodwill. He's saying that some of these people, and they're the Judaizers, as we know, they were, they were just doing it to try to get Paul executed, thinking if we preach the gospel... And then, uh, then they'll execute him. That's what their thinking was. That's why he says, some are, are sure to be preaching Christ even from envy and strife toward him, but some also from goodwill, good motives. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, the Judaizers, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Thinking, by teaching the gospel, he said, oh, make it more difficult for Paul Let's all of us talk, start talking about Jesus and the gospel <laughs> and thinking we can get Paul in trouble and execute. Maybe they'll execute him. It backfired. So Paul, and, and Paul just loved this. Then verse 18, he says, this is his dynamic, indomitable spirit. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. Pretense means, uh, you know, with bad motives. Or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, body whether by life or by death. Now that's exactly what Paul is thinking of when he wrote 2 Timothy. Keep going. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm not afraid of death. <laughs> it's actually, if I die, it's, 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 I'm perfected. 
But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So he's talking about his confidence that he's going to see them again. And so God was going to make it easy for him, and he's going to, you're going to stay around. Well, his second Roman imprisonment, when he wrote 2 Timothy, he knew he was going to be executed. He was sure of that. And his first Roman imprisonment, as he says here in Philippians 1, he was sure of the fact that he convinced that he was going to be released, and he was. And, uh, but his second, in 2 Timothy, his second Roman imprisonment, he wrote that 2 Timothy, he knew he was going to go, he knew he was going to go home to be with the Lord. In fact, look at second, go back to 2 Timothy, Look at chapter 4. Look at 2 Timothy 4.1. So the whole diff a different uh, attitude of Paul in 2 Timothy 4 in his second Roman imprisonment than this Philippians chapter 1 in his first Roman imprisonment. In Philippians, he knew he was going to be released. Here, he knows he's not. He's going to be executed in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4.1, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. That's what pastors should be doing, an evangelist. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. When, it's, when people want to hear it and they don't, or they don't want to hear it whether they're on fire for it and, and craving it or not. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. That's what pastor's job. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accu accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. We see this today uh, in America today with the internet. Uh, you don't like Pastor uh, Billy Bob? Well, you can go down and look at the other website with a click of mouse, and you know, like what he's Billy Bob's teaching, you can go over to Jimmy Bob, you know, and Jimmy and Jimmy Bob or whatever his name is, Jimmy John, and you can listen to Jimmy John. And if he's teaching dating, relationship, and marriage, you can listen to him. But if Billy Bob is teaching on the doctor of sanctification, or he's teaching through the book of Daniel, and you know, three hundred hours of Daniel, oh, I can just I can just bump and listen. Forget about him. I'll listen to somebody who's teaching what I want to hear. You know, how to be rich, you know, uh, how to get it, you know, take care of your dog and your cat or something like that. Uh, I'm being facetious here, but that's what people do. They accumulate teachers for themselves. They, that, the, 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 one of the great dangers of the internet is that you, it's, 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 it, it can, you can have your ears tickled and you can go jump to the next website and listen to somebody who's more along your lines or fits your mood at the time and listen to them. You know, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't in, uh, it doesn't promote faithfulness to a ministry, which is God wants. So uh, we see here that, yeah, people want their ears tickled today. We see that today. We can see that because they, they don't stay in one ministry or they flip around from this pastor to the other pastor. And they have, they're listening to five different guys. There's nothing wrong with that. To the certain, only as long as you're faithful and following along with the teacher of your pastor. So if your pastor's teaching in 2 Timothy, why aren't you listening to him in 2 Timothy? If he's teaching on Sunday in Colossians, why aren't you listening to him? And especially with the website, you should never get behind. I mean, if you get behind, you get the website. If you can't beat every class face-to-face, -face, you go, you get the website, you know? If so, you, whoever your pastor is, he's your first priority is what I'm saying. Meaning, you listen to him first, then you want to listen to these other guys, but make sure you're caught up with what he's doing because the Spirit is saying something to the church now. So don't say, I listen to Dr. So-and-so and he's teaching right, one of his tapes from 1965. Oh, that's great. The Spirit was saying something to the church. You might get something out of that, yeah. But the Spirit was saying something to the church in 65 and wherever he, this pastor is, and he's saying something different to Billy Bob here in, Matt, in Iowa, Okay. I'm not Billy Bob, but he's, he's saying something to me, and there's something to Jim, and Jim Ricard, Pastor Jim Ricard, and other pastors in, in, in this country. The Spirit is speaking to us. So keep up to date what the Spirit is saying to the church now. That's your first priority. Then if you want to go listen to Dr. So-and-so on, you know, on, on his website, then fine. But your first priority is, is the guy who God has called you to. And don't tell me. Oh, don't you ever tell me you don't have a pastor, because you do. According to 1 Peter 5, 3, everyone is allotted to the charge of a pastor. 
And it says, obey your leaders. Well, that means you have a leader over you. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. So, well, let's, let's keep going on. Verse 4, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside the myths. But you, Timothy, be sober in all things, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now here's where his reference to his imminent demise. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. Departure from this earth. I have fought the f good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Oh, that... All of us pastors could say the same thing as Paul when it's time for us to die. That's my prayer, that I'll be able to sit there on my bed, my dying bed, or wherever it is, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fast or it's long or it's whatever, that I could sit there and go and have a clear conscience and say, yeah, I did this. In the future, there's laid up for me a, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his apparent. So, the gospel is omnipotent, people. Why? Because it's the word originating from God. It's the word originating from God. It's omnipotent. The Rome was powerful, and Nero was a powerful tyrant in Paul's day, but they were no match for the omnipotence of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, whether Jew or Gentile, and it has the power to transform sinners into the image of Christ. So therefore, why are pastors in the church, in America today, for instance, why are they talking politics? Beware of all those guys out there who are talking politics with the upcoming election because you know what those guys are? They're playing to the crowd. You know, they're playing to their crowd. They should be emphasizing the gospel. They should be teaching the, the Bible, verse by verse, expository teaching. You can throw in some uh, topical studies in between. But the word of God, the gospel should be being taught from pulpits, not politics, not, social, not teaching on social issues or history. I know one guy is out there, he teaches history. He's like, you'd be kidding me. If I wanted a history, I'd go to, the, I'd go to a university or a college or something or a high school get, or get a history book. He's, the job of the pastor is to communicate the gospel. And why don't these people do that? Because they don't believe in the sufficiency of the gospel. They don't believe in the power of gospel to transform sinners and to convert the unsaved. They don't believe in it. And, that, and Christians don't, a lot of Christians don't believe in that today because they don't support ministries that are gospel, that, that are faithful to the gospel and biblical teaching, expository teaching. They don't spend them, they don't devote, they don't send any money to those ministries. They don't go and attend those churches. They don't believe in the power of the gospel. I do. Whether there's a, 10 people or 2 people around me or 100 people around me or 1,000 people around me, I believe in it. Whether anybody's following me or running with me or not, I can keep going because I know what it is. It's the power of God for salvation. And I've seen its work in not only my life, but people in my ministry through the years. I've seen it. Look at Romans chapter 1, please. We'll wrap this up. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 8. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. Romans 1, 8. For our, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers making requests, if perhaps now at last by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift so that you may be established. It's not spiritual gift. It's spiritual blessing as we saw in the past. Uh, only God, the Holy Spirit, imparts a spiritual gift and that's a conversion. He's talking about spiritual blessing that is imparted to the church through the communication of the word of God. So I am, as I'm communicating the gospel, I'm imparting to you through the spirit a spiritual blessing. For I long to see you so that... Uh, so that I may impart some spiritual benefit, blessing to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. See, when you gather together with other believers, you encourage each other. If you don't gather with other believers, how are you going to be encouraged? And, I, and if you don't have, I tell you what, if you don't have a ministry in your area that's teaching the gospel and you can't fellowship, go move here. Come on to Iowa, why not? We'll, put, we'll, we'll get you a place here and find you a job. 
I, God, in fact, have a little faith. God will take care of you. That's what I did when I came to Iowa. I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to both Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now, they're already Christians. They're saved. He's right into Christians. So stop thinking the gospel is simply related to the non-Christian. It's related to the Christians. Because he's writing to Christians, and here he's saying, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith at conversion to faith after conversion, as it is written, but the righteous man, the saved, the Christian, shall live by faith. Faith in what? The gospel. So, Paul said it's the power of God for salvation. Why aren't we emphasizing the, the gospel in America today in our churches and emphasizing music or politics or some kind of social program and, or entertainment and the teaching is like five minutes or ten minutes and not even a half hour in many places. And why? They don't believe it's the power of God for salvation. They bought into the lie of Satan's cosmic system. And many seminaries are following, are being infected with this attitude as well. In fact, Met some seminaries are the result of this attitude. They propagate this, in, uh, this uh, lack of faith in the gospel. So Rome, as we close, had the power to execute criminals of the state and wage war so as to conquer nations and various ethnic groups, a, a power that was given to them by the word of God, by the way. But they were no match. Rome was no match for the omnipotence of the gospel. Therefore, Timothy... Paul wanted Timothy to be encouraged. Timothy should be encouraged that the gospel he proclaims is infinitely more powerful than the power of Roman Nero. When I preach the gospel, and that thing gets recorded, and it's all around the world. In fact, i got to get back to somebody who, and, uh, who uh, contacted me and complimented us on the, on, the, on the teaching on the website. Of course, I say us because it's us that's getting the gospel out. People who support this ministry financially, who attend classes, who are serving in this ministry in various areas, those are the people who are we're a team. And we are getting the gospel out, and that's exciting to know that this little old place in Iowa it can, is, a, is, is when it's faithful to the gospel, faithful to the word of God, is exercising, expressing the omnipotence of God, and we don't even know who might be getting saved through our website or our written materials or, or who's uh, growing the maturity or growing in their relationship with God as a Christian. We don't know. Once in a while we hear from some of those people. But one day we're going to find out the fruit that came from this ministry. We'll find out. We'll find out the Bema seat. It's, and it's the power of God, the gospel. That's, that's, we should have confidence. When I'm up here teaching, I'm, it's, the, it's the greatest message in the world. You know, it's, it's greater than any political message, and you're going to hear a lot about politics and right-wing and left-wing politics and libertarianism and all that stuff with the elections coming up. And you know, let me tell you something, that's fine. It's all right, you have a vote for whoever you think is right. All right, but at the end of the day, all those messages, they're all man-made. They're all, they're all, the, 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 all of them, their doctrine from their various political groups are inferior to the gospel and why a pastor who goes on television, used to be a pastor now, he's on, he's now he's teaching politics and running for governor or used to be a governor. How you could abandon the, jo the greatest job in the world communicating the gospel for politics is beyond me. It's the epitome of apostasy that, that somebody is like that. That that person is really true, and yet people, Christians, think he's the greatest thing. If he's a pastor, I would be, a sh I would be, I would be ripped at that guy. Are you kidding me? We have the greatest message. What are we talking politics for? We're talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means to the unsaved and, and what it means to the Christian and the victory that they can have over sin and Satan now. But we're wasting our time on all kinds of gobbledygook and entertainment and all kinds of garbage in our churches today. Nero's Rome could end the biological life of Paul, but his faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ gave him eternal life. Therefore, though he might die physically, and he did, at the hands of Nero's Rome, he would continue to live forever in the presence of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he responded to the gospel in faith. 
In fact, at his second advent, which ends Daniel's 70th week, Jesus Christ will violently bring an end to the final stage of the Roman Empire, as we studied, which will be under the Antichrist, who will be a dictator, who will emerge out of Rome, according to Daniel chapters 7 and 9. In fact, Jesus Christ, the living word of God, will destroy the final stage of the Roman Empire. And God, remember we studied studying Daniel, and the word of God will have conquered all the nations of this earth and brought them under subjection to himself. And we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and may we never be ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. This is the greatest choice and greatest decision you ever made in your life is to be a part of a ministry that's teaching the gospel. There's no other decision that you make in life, including your spouse, that you choose or a decision to have a children. Nothing can beat this decision that you have made to be faithful to a gospel ministry. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage us with what we've heard. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.